Hello, gents. Hope you're all doing well. It's nice to have you all back again um, for this um, year's device masterclass. We've got a lot of um, things um, waiting um, to, to, to get taught, and we've got a lot of presenters coming up, um, chiefly Dr. Grab, that, who's presented here before, um, from Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and he's doing a talk on infection, which is an implanter's worst enemy. Um, so over to you, Dr. Grab. Uh, thank you very much, Julius. I will try and share my screen and you can tell me if uh, if it's working. That's fantastic, Dr. Grab. Slides visible to you guys? Yeah. That's that's good. Okay, well, thank you very much um, to CVEF for inviting me to give this talk. Um, Device infection, of course, really is the patient's worst enemy. That's the person who gets affected by it all. And the main focus of my talk here is really about how to avoid device infections in the first place, because prevention is better than cure. You're better to um, modify your practice to minimize the risk of device infection rather than have to contend with what can be a very difficult problem if patients have had their device uh, chronically implanted for a few years. Um, just one disclosure, and that is that uh, I've worked as a proctor for Philips and Spectronetics who make lead extraction equipment um, since 2020. So the outline of my talk today then is, I'm firstly going to explain to you how big a problem infection is in countries that uh, do high volumes of device implantation and why device infections are particularly bad news for patients and therefore for our centres as well. Then I'll go on and run through the pre-operative, intra-operative and post-operative measures that you can take to keep the risk of infection to a minimum with device implantation procedures. And then finally tell you a little bit about lead extraction, which is really the default way of managing uh, device infections where I work. But I fully understand that um, in some countries, there is no access to lead extraction tools or lead extraction expertise. So I'm going to also explain to you how you may manage patients who have device infections without doing a lead extraction procedure. So firstly, the, the scope of the problem. Um, well, we're going to be talking about three different types of device infection. Uh, these are categorized in order of seriousness. Firstly, we sometimes see soon after implantation a superficial incisional infection may relate to the suturing. There may be a small stitch abscess. The infection is just confined to the skin, really. Uh, and that is not too much of a problem as long as it's recognized quickly and as long as it's treated before the infection spreads down into the pocket where the device itself is implanted. And I'm only gonna to touch on this very briefly here to say that um, if you suspect a superficial incisional infection, the patient needs two weeks of oral anti-staphylococcal antibiotics, and that should be enough to, to take care of the problem. Then the, the most common presentation that I see is a localized pocket infection and that may either present with the uh, device pocket becoming swollen, red, tender, um, obviously infected, or sometimes with a, a more subacute picture where the device gradually migrates towards the surface uh, and the skin may become broken over the device. And once the skin is broken, that's it. Um, you know, really there is very little prospect of rescuing the situation um, short of taking all the leads out. And then most seriously, we have endocarditis and um, systemic sepsis uh, resulting from a device infection spreading into the blood or into the heart itself. And that is very bad news indeed, because even with lead extraction and um, aggressive antibiotic therapy, significant numbers of patients will die uh, if they end up with a systemic device related infection. So for new implants, um, if you look at published case series, uh, de device infections affect around one in 200 new implants. 
And uh, here in Edinburgh, we, we implant around a thousand devices a year. Um, now, some of these will be generator replacements. And we probably see three or four new acute device infections each year, despite the precautions that we take with antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, these are usually diabetic patients, usually older patients who get the infections. And with generator replacement, we know that the risk of a device infection is three or four times as high as it is for a new implant. And I think a lot of um, trainees don't really understand uh, that actually a generator replacement is quite a risky procedure in terms of infection. But the reason for that is that you're implanting the new device into a fibrotic avascular pocket. So the device is in a way shielded from the immune system. There's not a good blood supply around the device. So therefore, if there is any bacterial contamination into the pocket, uh, then it's not immediately exposed to a soup of white blood cells and antibodies and complement and all the things which normally would help you to fight uh, a device infection. Most device infections are caused by skin organisms, so staphylococci. Um, Staph epidermidis is probably the most common uh, infecting organism, and typically that causes a slow burning uh, subacute device infection. We find that these are often ignored by patients. Um, if the patient sees their family practitioner, uh, then the seriousness of the device infection is not fully appreciated, may be treated with multiple courses of antibiotics without ever being referred to the implanting center. And so by the time we see the patient, the tissues have all broken down and the patient might be quite sick because of the infection. So educating patients to recognize early signs of infection is actually quite important. And so we provide patients with written information at discharge, telling them what to do if they have any red flag symptoms. Uh, then around about 20% of the device infections we see are because of staph aureus, half of which will be methicillin resistant. So much more difficult to treat, uh, a much less um, big range of antibiotics that you can use to effectively eradicate the infection. But the reason that device infections are bad news, even pocket infections, is that if they're managed conservatively, uh, the data from case series suggests that the mortality is between 30 and 60% within two years if the system isn't removed. Um, so that, that really is a very high mortality rate. Lead extraction is considered quite a high risk procedure as far as uh, device procedures goes. But despite that, despite that risk, on balance for the vast majority of patients, it's safer to do a lead extraction procedure so that you can completely eradicate the infection um, because the mortality is maybe up to about 4% over two years if you can manage to get the system out and kill the infection off with antibiotics. There is a halfway house with this, and I will explain what that is towards the end of the talk. Um, but these are the reasons why we take device infections so seriously. They can kill patients. So little things that you can do, preparing your patients for surgery, taking care in the operating room, and not forgetting about post-operative care can literally make the difference between life and death for the patients that you are treating. We are implanting progressively more complicated devices into older patients and sicker patients with heart failure. And if you look at the data on this graph from a Danish device cohort uh, of nearly 100,000 patients, and you look at the incidence of device infection over a 20 year follow up, then you can see that for patients who have in green the CRTD devices implanted, so these are big devices in patients with heart failure, um, so it tend to be a sicker population, bigger devices tend to equate with more infection risk or more risk of erosion, then we're seeing an incidence of device infection as high as one in five for these patients followed up over 15 to 20 years. Whereas for a simple Brady pacemaker, you can see the bottom line in yellow here, 
the infection risk is much less than that, possibly because the need for box changes is less. You're not having to replace the device so frequently. It's also a much quicker implant, so the pockets open for less time, less risk of bacterial contamination at the time of the implant itself. So the fact that we are doing more sophisticated procedures on older, sicker patients using bigger devices, that's the reason we're seeing uh, a, a big uh, increase in device infections over time. From the Danish cohort and from the PADIT trial, which I'll come back to in a minute when talking about preventing device infections, um, we realized that there are quite a few risk factors for device infection over a patient's lifetime. And it's interesting, complex devices, ICDs and CRTs are more likely to get infected. And it may seem odd for me to say that if you're younger, you're more likely to get a device infection. Um, at your first implant, the risk of an infection is higher if you're older. But of course, when you're young, you've got a lifetime of device implants ahead of you. So if you get your first device when you're 30 and you otherwise have a healthy heart, you might be looking at four or five generator replacements throughout your lifetime. And with each generator replacement, the risk of infection goes up and up and up. So the cumulative risk of you having an infection over your lifetime, if you start out young when you get your first device implanted, that risk is actually quite high. Um, if a patient's had a previous device infection, they are more likely to get another device infection at re-implant, uh, two or three times as likely as a de novo implant. And also re-operation. So that means if you have to do a lead reposition, if you have to evacuate a hematoma, uh, then your risk of getting an infection is higher, obviously because you're opening the pocket a second time and potentially contaminating it. So anything that you can do to reduce the risk of lead displacement or reduce the risk of bleeding during the operation is going to go a long way to reducing the risk of the device getting infected. In addition from PADIT, um, they identified what are perhaps quite predictable risk factors for infection. So we see more infections in diabetics and especially in patients with advanced renal disease. Um, Patients who have dialysis-dependent renal failure, because they are being instrumented all the time and having episodes of bacteremia a lot, they are at really high risk of device infection. And we are actually now using leadless pacemakers wherever possible in renal patients who need bradycardia support. But I appreciate that that's a relatively new technology which isn't widely available elsewhere. Patients on steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs will be at increased risk of infection. And in general procedures where the operating time is greater than one hour, uh, the risk of contamination and infection goes up. So that really means most CRT implants will fall into that category. And if the patients had two or more previous implants, then by then they've got a pretty fibrotic avascular pocket and the risk of infection goes up with that too. Sorry, um, Dr. Grab, <clears throat> really quickly, I, yeah. I may have missed it. Um, um, why does a male sex have an increased risk of infection? I didn't quite catch it. So it's just an observation. Um, we tend to see more erosions in men. Now, it may be that men have less subcutaneous tissue over the device. So the risk of the device eroding through the skin might be slightly higher in males for that reason. Um, but I've, other than that, I'm unclear why men are more at risk of device infection than women, but it's an observation that was made from the Danish cohort. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, there are other factors driving lead extraction very briefly other than infection. Um, the incidence of lead failure in ICD leads is much higher than in brady pacing leads because of the more complex design trying to cram more conductors and cables into a lead the same diameter. Uh, we're sometimes extracting because of vascular occlusion to allow us to recanalize blocked veins. And I've got a case coming up soon of a patient with an occluded superior vena cava, which we're going to try and uh, extract the leads from and then stent. Uh, and also some patients have leads which are on advisories, um, field safety notices uh, where you're better off extracting the leads early before they cause a problem 
than waiting for 20 years and, and then the extraction becomes difficult and risky. Um, so in countries where extraction is available, there are other reasons why we might be led to do that procedure than infection. Now, in Europe and in US, now 35% of new imp implants are ICDs and CRTDs, and these are patients, therefore, who have a higher than average risk of device infection. <clears throat> Defibrillator leads have a bigger diameter. They have shock coils in them, a uh, single coil lead, of course, only in the right ventricle. A dual coil lead also will have a coil in the superior vena cava. And these coils cause a lot of fibrosis. So when I'm removing these leads, it's where the coil is, it's where the lead is stuck to the wall of the heart or stuck to the wall of the vein. And they can be very difficult to remove. And it's not much fun chiseling away at a lead in somebody's superior vena cava, either with a cutting burr or with a laser. Uh, the leads are of more complex design, so more likely to fail over their lifetime. And of course, a CRTD system has three leads per device, typically. ICD patients now are younger and live longer because we're implanting a lot of them for primary prevention in younger patients with myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathy. So they get more upgrade procedures, maybe to CRT and more device replacements and may accumulate a greater burden of leads in their body over their lifetime. So if you're a lead extractor like me, there's no shortage of business because of this. So that's a bit of background as to the scope of the problem, um, why infection is bad and why we're seeing more infections over time. And in the countries where you work, as you build up your device implantation programs, you have more implanters, you are eventually going to be encountering these problems on a fairly regular basis. You need to have good preventive strategies in place and you need to know what to do if somebody gets an infection. So a few general principles for avoiding infection to start with. Uh, the generator changes are the easy cases for the new trainee. The surgery is easy. You don't need to put new leads in. You're just practicing cutting down onto the pocket, taking the old device out, putting the new device in and sewing up. But it's especially important in these cases that you observe your pre-procedure care uh, you use your antibiotic pro prophylaxis, you have scrupulous surgical technique when you're replacing the device because the risk of infection is three or four times as high as with a new implant. We sometimes consider in high-risk patients using an antimicrobial envelope. Now, these are uh, a mesh envelope impregnated with rifampicin and um, minocycline, but they're expensive. Uh, the, the Tyrex pouches, as we call them, cost almost as much as a single chamber pacemaker in the UK. So we can't implant them in everybody. We bankrupt ourselves. But in patients who have had a previous device infection or maybe a dialysis dependent patient with renal failure, we might consider using one of these envelopes to prevent uh, an infection. And if available, uh, we would use a leadless device for Brady re-implants in some patients. But what you need to do is use meticulous aseptic technique, be strict with hemostasis, and do not overcomplicate your procedure. So don't try and implant new leads unless it's not strictly necessary to put that new lead in. Don't do device upgrades unless you're confident that that upgrade offers a definite advantage to that patient because we know upgrade procedures are associated with high infection risks because they can take a long time. The risk of hematoma, the risk of um, venous occlusion, that kind of thing are quite high with these procedures. So down to practical details then, you're going to see your patient in your center on the ward the day or a day or two before the device implant. What sorts of things do you need to pay attention to? Well, a lot of these patients are quite sick when they're in hospital. They may have concomitant infections like a chest infection or a urinary infection, and that needs to be treated before you implant the pacemaker. Because we know that if you implant, when the patient has an active infection in their body, the risk of the device becoming implanted is quite high. So our rules in Edinburgh are that the patient has to be apyrexial 
for a minimum of 48 hours before we do the implant. If the CRP has been elevated because of an infection, it must have either normalized or at the very least be on the way down before we would consider implanting. We take a careful look at whether the patient's on antiplatelets and anticoagulants, and anything that we consider not essential, we will stop before we do the implant to keep the risk of bleeding down to a minimum. And we'll optimize diabetes control in the diabetic patients, which account for around a quarter of the patients who get implants in Edinburgh. And we ideally like to have the blood glucose less than 10 millimoles per liter when the patient is taken to theater so that the pacemaker is not being implanted in a soup of sugar, which is a good culture medium for bacteria. In terms of preparing the patient for theater, we remove hair with clippers, so electric clippers, and not with a dry razor, because a dry razor will abrade the skin, it will stir up bacteria and actually increase the risk of infection. We get the patient to shower on the morning of the procedure, and we wash over the implant site with chlorhexidine uh, on the ward before the patient even goes to the theater. And if there's any of that uh, electrode adhesive, which tends to pick up dirt, uh, when the electrodes removed, we'll remove the adhesive using acetone and a swab. And you have to think also, if you're worried about erosion, it's an elderly patient with very thin skin. Uh, maybe you want to do a subpectral implant so the device has more coverage and a bit less risk of erosion. So get the patient consented for that if that's what you think you're going to do. Nice uh, picture from Port Harcourt. Um, so this is the antiseptic. And I have to say, when I was on the mission in December, I was extremely impressed with the care and attention that was taken to skin preparation. It was done absolutely meticulously. Um, I think probably to a higher standard than it is done in Edinburgh. Um, it took quite a long time to get the patient prepped. Uh, I later on looked up about the Purit antiseptic, and it's a nice chlorhexidine preparation, which... Uh, which is uh, very good for killing off skin bacteria. Um, and uh, so something like this or a povidone iodine solution uh, will be needed to get the, the site prepared. There was actually a study done in the Cleveland Clinic uh, in, published in 2015, looking at two different skin prep uh, preparations, chlorhexidine alcohol versus povidone iodine. Uh, and actually the Cleveland Clinic just switched from one to the other and then did a just a, a, a study um, retrospectively looking at uh, what proportion of patients ended up with a device infection within the following year. And it was roughly evenly balanced how many patients had each type of skin prep. Uh, and they used regression analysis to identify what the risk factors for infection were. So if the skin prep was an important factor here, it would have um, come out in the regression analysis. And what they found was that skin prep didn't matter which type you used, as long as you used a good antibacterial skin prep. They had an infection rate of about 1.1%. Um, but bear in mind that there are quite a lot of generator replacements within uh, this study. Uh, so quite a high infection rate, but equal between the two groups. And actually, the things that were found to be the strongest predictors of infection were diabetic status. Interestingly, race. So African-Americans were 2.6 times as likely to get a device infection uh, as Caucasians. And I'm unclear what the reason is behind that. Uh, there may be many factors behind this, um, such as African-Americans being disadvantaged in their health in general. Um, so that may be a factor. Uh, they come in sicker, more infection prone, perhaps. And a history of heart failure also uh, predicts uh, device infection, possibly because the heart failure patients are more likely to end up with an ICD or CRT, which in itself is associated with a higher infection risk. So coming on to antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, which should be used before every device implant. Um, there has been a meta-analysis done looking at antibiotic prophylaxis regimes in general prior to device implantation. This was published more than 20 years ago. And there have been a lot of different um, prophylaxis regimes tried, ranging from single-dose antibiotic prophylaxis just before the patient gets operated on, 
to more elaborate regimes where the, the patients are given antibiotics afterwards, the pocket is washed out with, you know, hydrogen peroxide or some kind of uh, antimicrobial agent. Um, but I'll tell you what's come out of these analyses, and that is that straightforward single dose, one shot antibiotic prophylaxis is probably as good as anything. In the PADIT trial, what they did was they took nearly 20,000 patients, of whom about a third had generator replacements, so again, quite high risk for infection. And they randomized these patients to conventional single-shot prophylaxis versus an enhanced prophylaxis regime, which I'll describe on the next slide. And the primary endpoint was uh, readmission within 12 months with a device infection. So the single dose antibiotic regime was either intravenous cefazolin, which had previously been shown to be an effective antibiotic for preventing device infection, or in penicillin allergic patients, they were given intravenous vancomycin. In the enhanced group, they received the same thing, but the pocket was also washed out with bacitracin, which is a kind of antimicrobial, and they were given following the procedure two days of oral cephalosporin or clindamycin uh, to see if that further reduced the risk of device infection in these patients. And the outcome was that there was perhaps a slight trend towards better outcomes in the patients who had the incremental regime, but it was not statistically significant within this study. So the main thing that makes a difference to the risk of device infection is the upfront antibiotics that that patient received beforehand. And in current UK guidelines and European guidelines, it's said to be level of evidence 2B, which means not very good evidence at all for using, using additional antibiotics after the initial implant uh, to further reduce the risk of infection. Now, we all do that from time to time. And they're, they're, I think one of the last cases that Dr. Adathi and I operated on was a reoperation on the last day of the mission of a CRT patient where we had to put the LB lead in on the second day because the patient got sick on the first day. Um, and it's understandable then that you might, without there being great evidence for it, give antibiotics afterwards in a situation like that. Um, but we have to remember that that's just that using our own judgment rather than that being particularly evidence-based. But certainly I sometimes do that in Edinburgh, but I don't know if it makes much difference to risk in the end. Intraoperatively, um, you should consider a barrier membrane once you've prepared the skin. Um, so it, it can just be a, a plastic sticky membrane or plastic impregnated with uh, iodine. Consider using diathermy, particularly in patients who are on antiplatelets or anticoagulants uh, to reduce bleeding and therefore the, reduce the risk of hematoma and, uh, and then device infection. And if you've got a nurse or a doctor scrubbed with you and assisting you, don't open the pack with the device and the leads in it until you absolutely need to. There's no advantage in having the leads lying on the table for 20 minutes if you're still trying to get access and struggling with it, um, they're just going to pick up contamination. Um, so don't open the packs until you need to open the packs. Be meticulous with skin closure. Make it neat. Uh, don't leave any gaps. Use surgical glue if you have it. Uh, I was looking up, you can get certain types of glues very, very cheaply indeed. Uh, and these have um, sort of bactericidal agents in them which can just form a barrier to bugs getting in after you've closed the wound. You should also do everything you can to avoid reoperation. So when you put the leads in, just spend a minute or two being absolutely sure that the leads are stable. So stability tests, getting the patient to cough, sniff, take deep breaths, make sure the leads are okay, they're not going to fall out of position because you don't want to reoperate for that. And hemostasis is important too. So using diathermy, if there's any doubt about bleeding, just wait, just put a swab over the open wound so no bugs get in, wait two or three minutes and make sure that no bleeding is starting up and only close when you're happy. So I'm saying on the one hand, operation time can be a factor in getting infections, 
But for sure, if you rush and the patient ends up with a hematoma or a leap displacement and needs to be operated on again the next day, then that for sure will increase the risk of infection too. So this is just an example of the kind of membranes that you can put over um, uh, the skin. We do this routinely in Edinburgh for all device implants. And it's nice because you know you're not going to be dragging bacteria from the skin into the pocket when you put the device in. And uh, Dermabond is quite expensive, but there are other equivalent um, uh, surgical glues that you can use uh, to put over your closed wound at the end if you want to. Then post-operatively, uh, we need to consider when to restart anticoagulants. Now I've had patients who have blown up hematomas over their device because somebody has prescribed low molecular weight heparin the evening on the day that they've had the procedure. So they get 17,500 units of delta paran injected into them and bang, everything swells up. So typically I would leave restarting anticoagulation until the following day. Um, there are situations where we might operate with the patient fully anticoagulated, such a, as a patient with a prosthetic heart valve, but in most cases, you can wait a bit before restarting them. And post-operatively, make sure that the diabetic control remains good. For wound care, uh, we have a full coverage absorbent dressing like we have here. There are lots of different types that you can use. And the patient should be given written wound care advice, trying to keep the wound dry for at least a week, and ideally with a dressing in place, which they might change every two to three days. And patients should be instructed to report any redness, new swelling, pain, uh, or discharge from the wound to the implanting centre. In practice, we find that if they report to general practitioners or family practitioners, they'll get given a course of antibiotics and not referred to us, and then treatment gets delayed and the patients can get sick. Now I'm going to talk a little about lead extraction for the last, uh, the last um, part of the talk. And I want to first of all talk about definitions because there's a difference between an explant and an extraction. So an explant is where, let's say you implant a pacemaker, dual chamber system, and six weeks later, the patient's got a pocket infection and you know everything needs to come out. That's easy. You just use local anesthesia, you open up, uh, take the pacemaker out, unpick the stitches, and take the leads out and they will slide out as easily as they went in. It's not difficult and it's not risky for the patient. But lead extraction refers to removal of chronically implanted leads. Typically they've been in place for more than a year and this requires special tools because the leads tend to get stuck wherever they make contact with the wall of the vein or the wall of the heart. So often we'll see fibrous adhesions here at the entry point into the vein where there's a cuff of scar tissue formed over the lead. At the junction of the innominate vein and the superior vena cava here and in the SVC itself, we'll often see adhesions, sometimes at the SVC RA junction, the tricuspid valve. I've had one case of severe tricuspid regurgitation after a lead extraction. And then in the insertion point of the lead into, into the heart itself, especially if it's a deep lead with a shock coil. So if you try and pull these leads out, you're gonna tear something. So you can't just pull, or you're gonna do some serious damage or end up with a patient dying on the table. So what you need to do is put something rigid down the center of the lead. And we call that a locking stilet or locking wire. And then you feed a sheath over the outside of the lead and cut away at the scar tissue, which is attaching the lead to the veins or to the heart itself. And you either use a powered sheath using a mechanical cutting burr or use a sheath with fiber optics and laser to cut through the, uh, the adhesions. Extraction has to be done in a safe environment and has to be done with somebody who does a lot of lead extraction because operator volume is closely related to mortality rate with lead extraction. So it's not something you can dabble in. You either do it and do a good volume of it, or you don't do it at all. You have to have a good range of tools available to you, and extraction tools do tend to be quite expensive, unfortunately, 
and you need immediate cardi cardiac surgery backup. And that means a perfusion team, a cardiac surgeon, a cardiac anesthetist in case a complication occurs. And you've got to know when you're not winning. Some leads just won't come out and you should just stop and not end up with a disaster on the table. And then have a good post-operative plan afterwards um, so that uh, you know how you're going to kill off the infection and decide what your reimplantation strategy is going to be. Edinburgh Heart Centre is the extraction centre for the east of Scotland and for the highlands of Scotland. And we take around 60% of Scottish referrals for uh, device infection. And at the moment, I'm the only independent extraction operator on my side of the country, although I'm training a colleague up to do these procedures as well. We do around 50 cases each year, and I've been the main operator since 2001, so I've been doing this for a long time, and I've done a lot of extractions. We did a four-year audit of uh, device extractions between 2016 and 2019, um, where we had nearly 200 cases with an infection, infective indication for extraction in almost all of them. There was one on-table death due to a tear in the superior vena cava, and that was when I was on holiday and a low volume operator did the extraction procedure. We had, however, 13 deaths within 30 days of lead extraction and 12 of these patients had infective endocarditis relating to their device. So this shows you that even if you get the, the leads out, if a patient has endocarditis, staphylococcal endocarditis, uh, then the risk of that patient dying from endocarditis is quite high. So we see more, many more deaths due to the infection than we see deaths due to our attempts to remove the leads. And I think that very starkly shows you that if you have a patient who gets endocarditis as a result of a device you implant, there's a very high risk that patient won't make it, even with the best efforts. So that's just a summary of what we've got. So most patients surviving and surviving well, but a proportion dying within 30 days and one on table death here. With um, Lead extraction, there's been a, a, a registry called the Electra Registry, a European lead extraction control registry, looking at the incidence of major procedure related complications from extraction. And uh, that's roughly in keeping with, with our data, one in 200 patients had a serious complication and actually died from the extraction. Well, 0.5% mortality is one in 200. So our data are exactly in keeping with the European data. So we are performing as expected as an extraction center and no better, no worse. We learned a lot of points from the intraoperative death uh, that occurred back in 2019. Uh, the first thing was that the cath lab is not a good environment for lead extraction. That's where that procedure was done. The operator was slow to recognize that there was a problem. Uh, blood pressure was down during the operation and there was definitely an element of denial that something bad had happened to the patient. And people kept questioning whether the blood pressure reading was correct, whether the patient was just vagal on the table, was there an instrumentation error? And therefore, it, there was a big delay in calling the surgeon um, we use a device called a, a bridge balloon, which is a, a long balloon that's placed in the superior vena cava in the event of a tear. And you can inflate that balloon and um, basically block the hole in the superior vena cava, buying time for the surgeon to rescue the patient. And uh, there was a big delay in getting the occluder balloon uh, deployed. Also, the patient was not properly consented for this procedure and therefore the family were blindsided, and by that I mean they were completely unaware that this was a high-risk procedure. And because they were unaware of this and hadn't been counselled on this, and then their relative died, that is one of the factors that has resulted in a big complaint coming into the hospital about the way that case was managed. And so our team collectively learned a lot from that. Then, wind forward forward to March 2022, and uh, I was the 
first operator with this case. And this is just illustrating the difference that having a good setup and a fast response makes. So I had a 63-year-old male patient with a left-sided CRTD system. He'd had the leads in for 12 years. He had severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction on his echo. His underlying rhythm was atrial fibrillation with complete AV block and a poor underlying rhythm. Uh, tachytherapies had never been used on the device and he had an occluded left subclavian vein, so very, very intense fibrosis uh, around the leads. So we knew it was gonna be a difficult case. His uh, CRP was 85, gone up from less than five, but his other blood tests were unremarkable. And he had a device erosion, therefore, with staph aureus bacteremia, three months after a generator replacement. Remember I said ger generator replacements could be bad news? Well, that was the case here. That is what we were dealing with. It's not what you want to see. Our operative plan was this was a high-risk case, multiple leads that had been in for more than five years. So we had a nominated surgeon and perfusion team on standby. The patient had an arterial line in place and we had the bridge balloon mounted and ready to go. Patient had a temporary pacing wire placed via the right femoral vein. The plan to use what we call a hybrid temporary pacing system. In other words, a new active fixation lead once the first lead was extracted. And we were going to defer implanting a new system until the infection was completely clear. We put a lead locking device or locking stylet in each of the three leads. And I find it very difficult to advance the glide light laser sheath over the right ventricular lead. There were a lot of adhesions from the clavicle all the way down to the heart. I switched the laser between the leads and it took a long way, a long time to loosen them up. And then as I went down into the right ventricle, the sheath jumped forward and the anaesthetist called pressures down. So we've got systolic blood pressure of 71 on 35. Clearly something has gone wrong. Well, we called the surgeon straight away. Sats were falling, end tidal CO2 is down, all signs that something really bad has happened. And then the patient lost their cardiac output and had a PEA cardiac arrest. Now the response was, we had the bridge balloon deployed in the superior vena cava within 20 seconds of the blood pressure going down. We commenced CPR, the surgeon was in and opening the chest within three minutes. The perfusion team and cardiac surgery nurses arrived soon after and we activated the major hemorrhage protocol so we had blood available. The blood pressure was maintained at greater than 100 with CPR throughout, and the staff rotated, and the oxygen saturation was good throughout resuscitation. We gave volume and vasoconstrictor, and when we took our hands off CPR, we had regained the cardiac output by the time the sternotomy was being performed. So an excellent response from the team. And then this is the note from the, the cardiac surgeon saying emergency median sternotomy. And uh, what he said was after quick inspection, it was clear that the repair would have required a very large patch and exsanguination of the patient to find good and healthy margin of superior vena cava for stitching. And briefly, they cooled the patient down to 24 degrees and did a fantastic repair, rewarmed. And the outcome was the patient was extubated within 48 hours, no neurological deficit, had a pneumothorax, which eventually settled and was in hospital for a total of 16 days. He had a leadless pacemaker implanted afterwards to keep the risk of infection down to a minimum. And he is now doing very well indeed. He doesn't have CRT, but he's alive and he's doing okay. So we had a debrief. We run through the timeline of the case. We highlight learning points where things go wrong without assigning blame to an individual person. And uh, after that, we now prep the chest for a sternotomy in every case of lead extraction, use an arterial line in every case. We have good access for volume replacement through the femoral sheaths. And we always do our procedures in the cardiothoracic theatres. In other words, in an environment that's familiar to the cardiac surgeon.
So I'll just maybe skip this a little bit. Um, we're looking at a little bit of preoperative imaging here. Um, and this can be quite useful for us when we're doing extractions to see how close the leads are to the wall of the superior vena cava. This looks pretty ugly here. Um, and you can often see where adhesions are on the way down into the heart. And you can use PET scanning if you have it available to highlight hot spots where the device is implanted if you're not sure it's infected or not. And this is the bridge balloon in place in the superior vena cava. And these are a couple of examples where I've in, done a test inflation of the bridge balloon, just showing the different positions that an SVC coil might be sitting in during a case. And I'll skip over one or two of these. So when we're doing the extraction, what we don't do is just pull on the lead and make a rip in the ventricle. We have the extraction sheath all the way down to the tip and then use counter traction to pull the lead away from the myocardium. And that's a much safer way to get a lead out. And you've seen this slide before. The laser sheath, which we used in that case where we had the complication, is a long sheath with fiber optics running down it where eczema laser is used to cut away at the scar tissue in the lead. And it's very, very effective for soft adhesions, but not very good for calcium where you need to use a mechanical cutting sheath. Sometimes use transesophageal echocardiography when the extraction sheath is being passed down into the heart. And uh, the sticking points tend to be at the clavicle, at the angle into the superior vena cava, where there are coils on the defibrillator lead, and so on. Sometimes we are rather alarmed by what we get out. So this is probably a bit of atrium, uh, but thankfully just atrial endocardium has come away with some fibrotic tissue uh, on the ventricular lead. You can see the shock coil here with some adhesion. And again, on the atrial lead at the same level, you can see that the lead was adherent at the SVCRA junction and that the tip electrode here has rather come apart in the attempt to extract, but we did manage to get it all out. And sometimes with a defibrillator lead, it can look like a kebab when you take it out, just this big sausage of meat that comes out with the lead. That is how adherent they can be to the heart sometimes when you remove them. So having done all of that, when you're thinking about re-implanting, you need to re-evaluate the original indication for the device. Because, um, for example, you may have a patient with sinoatrial disease who has a pacemaker implanted for sinus bradycardia, who is now in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Well, they're not going to get a sinus bradycardia again, so they might not need a device at all. Um, you may consider no device or a delayed re-implantation if the patient had a primary prevention ICD that was never used over several years. We most often would re-implant on the opposite side because we don't want to re-implant where there's been a recent infection. We'll sometimes use an antimicrobial envelope and sometimes use leadless or subcutaneous devices to keep the risk down for the subsequent implant. This is the expensive envelope that I was telling you about. And um, what it does is it reduces the risk of um, pocket infection to about a quarter of what the risk would otherwise be if you didn't use an antimicrobial envelope. But you can't use this in all comers. If you're talking about six, seven hundred pounds per envelope, um, that is an awful lot of money, about the same as a single chamber pacemaker. Uh, these have to be used very selectively, uh, even in our centre. So what if you are working in a country, as many of you are, where lead extraction isn't readily available? What, what do you do if you have a device which has been implanted for a long time and it gets clearly infected? Well, you do have options short of lead extraction. Firstly, if the device is sitting quite low down in the chest, it may be possible to cut the leads high up and then pull them out down into the pocket, leaving the cut ends up here and hope that the infection hasn't already tracked up to the entry point into the vein. And you might get away with that 
And if the patient is well, then you can do an implant on the other side. You could consider long-term antibiotic treatment, but the evidence from multiple clinical follow-up studies is that the outcome is bad with this if you have device infection with a median survival of less than two years because of sepsis and endocarditis. But there's been some very interesting work which might be very well applicable to countries where lead extraction is not so readily available, and that is continuous in situ targeted ultra high dose local antibiotic therapy. In other words, putting antibiotics into the pocket where the device sits. And in Topaz's study using local um, vancomycin and gentamicin, often after debriding, cleaning out the pocket, cleaning with uh, hydrogen peroxide, and then closing up, and with 14 days of treatment, this is a single center, single person study, if you like, but they are saying that you can avoid extraction in 90% of cases. That sounds almost too good to be true, but even if it is true to an extent, if you can avoid extraction in even half your patients, that opens itself up as an option that maybe could be considered uh, for centers where lead extraction is not easy to carry out. So this is something that, that that's worth looking at, um, certainly in Africa. So to conclude my talk then, preoperative preparation is the key. You want to avoid infections, not treat them. Don't do unnecessary procedures if you can avoid it at all. Generator changes and upgrades are high risk, so by all means teach on these cases but don't assume that these are low risks. So you need to watch your trainee like a hawk if you're teaching to make sure that they are observing scrupulous uh, aseptic technique, hemostasis and closure technique. You should use approved antibiotic prophylaxis, avoid hematoma and lead displacement and educate your patients about signs of infection. Non-extraction strategies may work, particularly this high dose localized antibiotic therapy, but in general they are associated with poorer outcomes than if extraction is carried out. Well, I think I'll wrap up there and I'm very happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Graham. That was an absolutely fascinating and very insightful uh, presentation. Um, it's, I've learned so much from it. It's really, really good. Um, what I found really interesting, I think we spoke about this before, was the administration of the high, ultra high dose um, antibiotic uh, for patients who have like um, a pocket infection and things. And and I remember we were speaking about this and because <clears throat> we thought this was going to be really relevant to Africa, like you mentioned, when they don't have any um, lead extraction experts at all. Um, and and the, the, the study that came out was really, it was really good though. 90% um, of, of the patients did not need extraction at all. That, that's absolutely amazing. Like, um, and yeah, it, I'm, we, I'm always cautious of um, with it, with any new uh, technique for for any aspect of cardiology. I'm always cautious when I see brilliant results published by a single operator in a single center, because often when this is rolled out and done as a multi center strategy uh, and tested out more systematically, the results aren't as good as they first seemed. But even if even if the results um, are half as good as it is being said then you could potentially in half of the patients with pocket infection uh, have an option for them. Uh, whereas at the moment, you really just have the option of long-term antibiotics or cutting the leads and hoping uh, in these patients. And sometimes that ends badly. You know, I've, I've had some patients myself where they have appeared to be too frail for a lead extraction procedure. And um, we've cut the leads and sometimes it just gets infected where the lead ends are cut and eventually the patient will succumb to systemic infection. Um, 
So it, it, it's there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think this is something that we could look at in more detail and perhaps talk to uh, the people who conducted that study and get a bit, bit of advice about how that might be carried out um, in Africa. Brilliant, excellent. <laughs> You've got a lot of people um, writing in the test box saying an excellent presentation, very informative, um, well articulated lecture. <clears throat> So people really liked it, Dr. Grab. Um, I, I was thinking, next question, because my my centre in Northampton, we're not um, an extraction centre. So, and I, I know obviously Aberdeen wasn't, because you, you you did most of it. <laughs> yeah. um, how long does a typical case, um, typical extraction case last? How long? Just just an idea. I, I have no idea. So we, we, we do, we have an, uh, two afternoons, per month set aside for lead extraction at present. And uh, we usually only book one case in um, because if the leads have been implanted for a long time, remember these are often sick patients who have heart failure uh, or LV impairment and it takes a while to anesthetize them safely and it has to be done under general anesthesia. The surgeon, the anesthetist has to get an arterial line in. Uh, you sometimes need to get TOE down. It, 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 it takes time. So if the leads have been in for 10 plus years, then once the patient's asleep and on the table, it can take a long time to dissect the leads out from the fibrotic pocket. You're talking two to three hours for the actual surgery. Uh, we have often put a wound drain in uh, at the end. We've got to sort out the groin site where the temporary pacing wire and the bridge balloon has been. So, sometimes takes the whole afternoon to do a case. If, on the other hand, it's a more straightforward one, maybe the leads have been in for less than five years, we try and group them together, maybe do a couple of cases in an afternoon, because we know when the patient's asleep, it's probably going to take an hour or less to get the leads out in, in those cases. So we look at it case by case and then budget theatre time um, according to the complexity of the case. Oh, brilliant. Elvis, have you got a question? Or, or Dr. Daffy? You know? <clears throat> Elvis wrote something down, by the way. So, uh, uh, Just looking at my chat thing, but I can't see it. Um, ah. Uh, so, so, Chigozi, well, uh, maybe answer Chigozi's question. Is that okay, first of all? Because I can see it there. I can't see Elvis's question for some reason. Oh, no, no he's about to tell it. But yeah, but yeah, that's that's all right, yeah, Dr. Graf. Go for okay. it. Uh, I'll get you next, Elvis. Uh, right. So any specific clinical criteria as compelling indications for lead extraction? Um, well, if, if, if you have good evidence of either pocket infection or endocarditis, then that is a class one indication for lead extraction. I realize that can be difficult because sometimes you'll have a patient with a um, pacemaker pocket that maybe looks slightly puffy. You're not sure if it's infected or not. The CRP can be quite deceptive. If an infection is confined to the pocket, the CRP may not be raised. The patient may not have a high temperature or feel particularly unwell because at that moment in time, the infection's kind of just walled within the pocket, within that fibrotic capsule. It's probably okay to wait a little while with these patients to see if the infection declares itself or not. Um, sometimes it's swollen because the patient's taken a, a bump over the device and, and that will, will go down. Um, and relating to the next question that's just popped up on Line. We, we actually don't use PET scanning an awful lot. Um, our radiologists are surprisingly obstructive in Edinburgh and um, they, we, we don't have uh, very easy access to a PET scan. Um, occasionally it can be useful for confirming pocket infection if there's, if there's any doubt. If you suspect pocket infection without facilities to confirm it like PET CT, what would you do in that case? Um, I would probably watch and wait and see if anything evolves with that patient's pocket. So I might bring them back on a weekly basis just to have a look at what's going on. 
give the patient worsening advice. So if you develop a fever, if your appetite drops, um, you know, or if you start feeling like you have flu or unwell, then call us straight away and that more or less will confirm that an infection is there. If that slight swelling settles over time, then probably the pocket isn't infected and you can afford to leave it alone. It's sometimes just the case of clinical judgment, but what I would say is that usually if we have a suspicion of pocket infection and you cut into that pocket, you look inside, it is obviously infected. Um, so usually if, the, if you have reason to suspect infection, then it, you, you are actually dealing with an infection. So specific clinical criteria as compelling indications for lead extraction, well, um, it's just for a pocket infection, it's the signs I've spoken about already. And for infective endocarditis, if you have somebody with an implanted device and positive blood cultures for staphylococci and no other obvious source for infection, I would say by definition that patient has uh, a device-related infection and should be managed as if they have infective endocarditis even if you can't see vegetations on the echo, uh, I would treat that very, very aggressively with anti-staphylococcal antibiotics. And here in the UK, we would uh, do a lead extraction procedure uh, within, within two or three days of the diagnosis being made, uh, if we could. Um, so what's the average rate of pocket hematoma infection and the hematoma average size associated with infection? I'm not sure if I have any data on hematoma size and risk of infection. I think it's presence of hematoma at all around the device that probably confers the risk because then you have clot and a culture medium for any small low level of bacterial contamination uh, to set in uh, and, and multiply and infect the, the pocket. Um, how strongly is hematoma associated with infection? What's the rate of infection if you have a hematoma? It's roughly three to four times as high the risk of infection as if you don't have a hematoma. And the reoperation timing most associated with infection, that's actually a really good question. Um, if we had, say, a patient who had a dual chamber pacemaker implanted and had an atrial lead displacement, we will avoid reoperating within 48 hours of the original procedure because otherwise you're operating in an area where there's a lot of edema, the tissues are very swollen, it's difficult to unpick the old stitches out of the pocket, and so on. It's not essential that that atrial lead is moved straight away. We might even send the patient home and bring them back two or three weeks later to reposition the atrial lead because we think that the risk of a pocket infection goes down if you're not operating in a, an acutely hot and inflamed pocket from the original implant. Um, so sometimes you can't avoid having to reoperate within 48 hours. You just have to do it. Um, like if it's a ventricular lead displacement in a patient who's relatively dependent on their device, you can't sit on that and wait. Um, but in general, we'll try and avoid going back in uh, within the first few days. Now, Elvis, do you still have a question? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Grubb. Uh, quite a wonderful lecture. So I just um, noted down two things that are uh, related to what you talked about. Uh, one has to do with, due to the increased um, duration of uh, implanting, most like CRTBs and the pocket size as well. Uh, you know, it was part of the risk factors for increasing pocket infection. So I was wondering, would it be, because sometimes we do this, so I, although, could that be the reason why it's done or is it also recommended that we um, stuff the, stock the, uh, uh, put the, uh, impregnate some um, stock the pocket with sterile gauze which is soaked with povidone in order to prevent uh, uh, growth of, of um, bacteria within that region prior to that's for the duration of the implant because maybe it's a CRT Indeed. maybe that would also help to reduce the 
um, exposure and the risk of infection. I don't know if that there's any correlation with that. So um, I, I understand the reason for asking that question. So, so the question is, if, if you put some kind of um, bactericidal agent into the pocket before implanting the device, then could you reduce the contamination and then reduce the risk of infection? And I myself asked that question of our cardiac surgeons uh, quite a few years ago, thinking that that might be a good strategy. But you have to remember that if you apply those kinds of agents, so chlorhexidine or povidone iodine, to anything other than skin, they cause tissue damage. Okay, so chlorhexidine is a very alien um, sort of agent. Chlorhexidine normally comes with alcohol. You know yourself if you're in theatre and you wash your hands with this stuff and you have a cut in your hand, it hurts like hell. Um, mm. So it's not doing your tissues very much good. So it may kill the bacteria, but it may also cause superficial damage to the tissues and a bit of superficial necrosis, which a few days later down the line after implanting may actually increase the risk of infection. So current guidelines for um, preventing infection with device implantation do not include any kind of wash inside the pocket. Um, and and so no, I I would not advise doing that because of the risk of uh, of tissue injury. Okay, okay. So thank you very much. The second question would now be on uh, for battery change, where we already have the fibrotic pocket. Um, would it also be safe to impregnate the the pocket after the after the battery change, just to impregnate the pocket with? Um, maybe uh, with an antibacterial solution, maybe or medication, sorry, maybe uh, gentamicin or any of uh, whichever one, would it yeah. be safe to impregnate the uh, fibroctic pocket after changing the battery and implanting it? Yeah, so, it, so, uh, so that's actually what we do in Edinburgh, um, and we do that for new implants as well. Uh, one of the approved antibiotic regimes for prophylaxis prior to device implantation is flufloxacillin and gentamicin. And uh, flufloxacillin is given intravenously and in many centers, the gentamicin is given intravenously as well. But we give the gentamicin as an intra-pocket injection. So the highest concentrations will be around the device. And of course it does get absorbed systemically as well and then circulates. Um, but uh, we, we use that regime. It is not terribly evidence-based. And the current UK guidelines say that that doesn't offer additional advantage over and above uh, just using intravenous gentamicin and flucloxacillin. Um, but as it stands, and I think this is for historical reasons, we actually do exactly as you suggest uh, in Edinburgh. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> I was I was gonna ask a quick question, uh, Dr. Graham. And and <laughs> since we've been recorded, it's not um you don't have to answer. Um <clears throat> so given that um we get sometimes we get Tyrex pouches um that are out of date um donated. Um so some some may be about two months, three months, or even six months out of date. Um would you have like a, a cutoff point for using them? Say, how out of date do they have to be before you think? I I, I don't know, Julius, because I, I guess the risk is that if you implant additional for, foreign material into the pocket and the active agent in that pouch has degraded, so you, you implant the pouch, but let's say the rifampicin is no longer at the levels where it would be effective, then you may actually increase the risk of infection by putting something additional into the pocket that could get infected. Um, I think I'd need to maybe look into that and see what the you know degradation properties are for these particular antibiotics when they are kept in storage be before making a comment on that. Um, the short answer is I don't know. I, I suspect, you know, within 
three to six months is probably okay because the shelf life of Pyrex pouches generally is is reasonably long anyway. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't use a, a long out of date Tyrex pouch because you may inadvertently increase the risk of infection uh, for the reasons I've just given. Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Nafi, have you got any questions? You've been, you've been very quiet, conspicuously quiet. Jarrod? He's not at his terminal. <laughs> <laughs> No, nothing for me. Just a fantastic talk, and yeah, really appreciate your time, Doctor Grubb. But um, I think it just it's home the importance of, uh, I guess, from the moment the patient walks in to the moment they go home, how important it is to uh, prevent infections. And and I assume you know it's not. I assume it's just beyond the prep of the lab. It's it's the other members of the staff that need to be meticulous about you know touching the patient, face masks, gowns, things like that, and you know extends beyond uh, just the procedure itself. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point, Jared. Um, we do some of our pacemaker implants in the cath lab, and what I find in the cath lab, um, where you know it's a fairly quick scrub for angiography procedures, you're not, you know, implanting a stent doesn't carry the same infection risk as implanting a, a pacemaker or an ICD, and uh, staff are just a bit more lax about aseptic technique when they're doing angiography and PCI compared with a proper surgical procedure like a, a pacemaker or CRT implant. So I find myself constantly having to remind people about scrub duration and uh, just basic uh, discipline. And in fact, that's why I like doing my device implants in theater because when you do them in theater, people behave like they're in a surgical theater and they, they kind of subconsciously modify their behavior. Um, the other thing that happens in the cath lab is sometimes people will open the doors into the lab uh, right next to where your scrub trolley is. And, uh, you know, that's just air coming in from the area where people sit around doing their angiography reports straight onto, onto where the tray is. And, and that's unacceptable. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty strict. Uh, I think the staff find me quite annoying. But I'm the guy who has to deal with all the infections, uh, so so I have a vested interest in keeping things tight. No, it's very true. We used to, um, when I was at the Brompton uh, in London, we used to put signs on the door, you know, pacemaker, uh, pacemaker going on, do not enter without mask and hat and things like that, just to just to limit where you can. Yeah, yeah, good plan. Yeah. Yeah, some some consultants in. And Aberdeen used to do that as well, Dr. Grab. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Affolta, Dr. Affolta? Yeah, yeah, I know Jonathan well. Jonathan's a very meticulous guy, and that probably stands him in very good stead for device implantation. Yeah. He, he, well, he taught me how to read ECGs anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a good, good guy. Uh, yeah, he's a good guy. Any more questions, anyone? Elvis? No. Oh, okay. no. Dr. Duffy, are you <laughs> being conspicuous? I, I think there's something wrong with the Dr. Duffy. I've never heard him this quiet. <laughs> well, I wonder if he's had a TIA. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I think he's uh, probably back and forth to, to the terminal. He's probably busy. Oh. Awesome. Well, I think it was a really good talk, um, Dr. Grab. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think we'll be revisiting that like a few times. Um, okay. Brilliant. Really, really good. Um, I think we're just going to end it here, Dr. So Grab. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's it's um, it's been nice being able to give this presentation. and Hopefully, we can have a bit of discussion about the um, ultra high dose antibiotics uh, offline and, and maybe oh, see yeah. if we can do this on a small scale um, tryout basis in the future. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Th thanks again, Dr. Grab. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Dr.